Good morning. Uh, welcome to my very first show uh, for the learning experience. Today's topic is what I wish I knew when I graduated and three things that you must know. Uh, so this is my very first uh, live stream uh, of this kind. And uh, I don't how many people are here. So there's four of you uh, listening in. Thank you so much for uh, for dropping by and uh, and um, uh, and watching this video. Um, so um, I had uh, shared the link with a few people and asked them to share the link with others as well. Uh, so uh, I am I'm actually slightly nervous. And uh, I, I've been up since four o'clock in the morning trying to think of better ways to do this and experimenting and doing some test runs. And, and I think we are ready to go if you're ready to come with me. Uh, but let me just uh, share with you some of the uh, things that we're going to do today, uh, the agenda. Um, so uh, we, we, are, we have started 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock session starts. So I'm going to start with... Uh, who am I? Uh, just to give you uh, some background about uh, about what I do and um, why I'm doing this. And then we're going to go into the three things uh, that you should know that I wish I knew uh, when I graduated a million years ago. And then we're going to finish off with some action that you can take based on my sharing. So uh, I am expecting that this session will 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 last for maybe uh, 90 minutes to two hours or even one minute. Actually, I haven't got a clue. Uh, it will last as long as it will last. And it's my job to keep you uh, entertained and to give you some education. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to rush things uh, at the moment. So we're going to take it easy. But after this... Uh, Sure, I'm. I actually am going to uh, to organize a post-show virtual workshop on Zoom, and this will be limited to ten people only. And this is really, really my way of experimenting with this kind of format, uh, just to give a little bit more of an interaction with my viewers. All right. Uh, so I would start off by saying, who am I? So who is this guy that you're bothering to watch? Uh, so I've got. So I'm about to show you a picture, uh, and uh, I I don't want you to be shocked. So here we go. So this is me. This is Reza at 17 years old. And yes, I did have a lot of hair once. And no, I don't know what happened to it. Uh, so this was taken in 1980, let me think, 1986. Uh, no, this was taken in 1988 uh, when I was in uh, 17 and in the lower sixth form of my school at Wellingborough. So I went to school in the UK uh, and, um, and uh, all right. So uh, what, do I, what am I? I am a CEO. I am CEO of my own company, Right Eye Sundiram Brahat. Uh, and uh, apart from being CEO of that company, we do a lot of uh, corporate training. I am also classified myself as a bit of a dreamer. Uh, and uh, an and idealist. So I like to, to think about uh, the good things that is possible. The, I like to think about uh, what we can... I like to think of a perfect society and, and how we can go about in doing that uh, and uh, wishing things were better. Uh, so that's so that's me. I am also a vlogger. So you, 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 what you you're watching this on my YouTube channel. Uh, 
with all the 87 subscribers in it. Uh, so I did put in an intention to start uh, coming up to 100 subscribers, uh, still quite a way to go, and then eventually to 1,000 subscribers. Uh, so if you, uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, it would be much appreciated if you do. Please click on the subscribe button. Uh, and I do a lot of uh, vlogging and I, and I am intending to create a lot more of these kind of videos. Uh, and um, I want to, to start sharing uh, things with the world. Okay. All right. Uh, so if you are here, I am keeping an eye on the comment section. Leave a comment, leave in the comment section below to tell me who uh, who's watching and say hello. And if you have any questions, please also write in the comment section. Uh, I'm also a cameraman. You know, that there's a running joke between a cameraman and a photographer. Uh, so um, I, I like to take pictures uh, and I've, I've liked to take pictures for a long time now ever since I was at school. Uh, I'm also a Muslim and that's actually is my most important identity uh, and that defines and governs a lot of the things that I do that is my faith uh, and I am a husband uh, to my wife believe it or not uh, and and this, these are some of the roles that I have played. I have 27 years of experience and I started working in 1993 so that's a long time ago and I feel so old even though I'm not I haven't actually reached a half century yet uh, and I wanted to share with you uh, uh, what I have done uh, that 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 gives me the cloud or the right and the credibility to tell you and share with you some of my experiences. So uh, let me share with you my experience. So this is what I've been doing. First thing, I was a child actor. So if you're friends of mine, this is probably something that you don't know. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I, was, I actually acted in a movie. Uh, and even went so far as to get nominated for Best Child Actor. So this is, this is a picture of me at 11 years old. All right. I'm not going to tell you what movie I acted in because it still gives me a lot of goosebumps and I still feel horrified whenever I watch the movie. Um, okay. Uh, and then I... So I was a shoe store help in London. Uh, so I, I would work there uh, in, during my holidays to get extra money uh, at D.H. Evans, Oxford Street in London, now called House of Razor, or they changed their name to House of Razor. And I worked at the Carvella shoe store uh, as a stock boy, which basically meant that I would be in the storeroom. And if you go and buy a pair of shoes and you and you would see the, the salesperson take the pair of shoes and go in and then miraculously uh, a minute later come up with the exact size, color and, and material that you want is because there's somebody like me at the back who's taking the shoe and I've got this whole system sorted out to find exactly the shoe that I need in the color that I need, in the material that I need and the size that I need it to be. And it's even worse during the sale because during the sale, uh, all, uh, if you notice at the shoe store, at the shoe store uh, during sale, half of the pair of shoes would be displayed outside. And when you want to buy that pair of shoes, you would take that half to give it to the salespeople and they would go in and they have to locate the other pair, the other half of the pair and match it up and give it to the customer. So that's what I did. And even though it didn't seem like a very glamorous job, far from it, but I learned so much about systems thinking, which is something I'm going to share later. Then uh, I graduated in 1995. And when I graduated in 1995, I joined a company called 
Petronas. I joined as a legal counsel. And this, I think, would be one of the most significant part of my life, the period between 1995 and 2000, as a young legal counsel exposure. And it really solidified the person that I am today, even if it happened many, many years ago. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have had a tremendously um, good bosses to guide me and to nurture me and to teach me uh, not only the art of being uh, a good in-house legal counsel, but also to become uh, what I consider to be a person with a successful career. After that, in the year 2000, I joined a company called iPrintis, which is, was a company related to Petronas. And they were talking, iPrintis is all about um, uh, e-business and e-commerce. Uh, I spent some time there. And uh, in, nine, in 2002, I left iPrintis to go and join a company called Commerce.com. And Commerce.com, if you didn't know already, was the company that was awarded the concession to do the government e prolehan project, government e procurement project, the uh, which is uh, one of the what is it called, the multimedia super corridor MSC flagship project, and that was a huge project with a hundred thousand users, uh, with a system that was meant to improve procurement and sourcing. Uh, and then uh, in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, yes, I joined a company called A.T. Kearney, a consulting firm as an associate consultant or a part-time consultant. And my specialty was specifically on change management. Uh, and it was something that they would call on me to be involved in projects that involve large-scale change and transformation uh, in, in, in organizations. And it's really uh, the time when I hung around with exceptionally brilliant people who taught me the art of consulting, who taught me strategic thinking, and who taught me uh, the skills that I still use today. All right. So that is a, a consultant. I've put here in small letterings, uh, the fact that I was a professional photographer. So I spent some time as a professional photographer, a couple of months actually, uh, in pursuit of my interest in photography, I decided one of the things I'm going to do is to be a professional photographer, which basically meant that I would be charging people for my photography service, right? Uh, so I wanted to highlight one thing, which I think was my, one of my significant experience uh, in my career. If you look at this picture, this is a brochure of the Malaysia Philharmonic uh, Festival, right? Uh, and uh, this picture of the con principal conductor of the uh, of the Malaysia Philharmonic uh, Orchestra, Mr. Klaus Peter Flor, uh, is was taken by me. And the interesting story about this picture was that I had asked uh, the principal conductor uh, whether it would be possible for me to sit in front of him when he is... Um, uh, conducting rehearsals, live rehearsals for the MPO. Uh, so he thought about it and said, it's okay, if you don't make uh, much noise, then we can have you in. So uh, during one of the live rehearsals on a Sunday afternoon, I positioned myself right in front of me. I mean, he was lit about a meter away from me, behind me, sorry, in front of me were the, 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 prince, the front row of the violins. Uh, on the right were, were the violins, on the left were the, the cellos. And I was sat in front of him with my camera, and they were rehearsing uh, Mahler's uh, symphony. Uh, I think it was, I think it would be the sixth symphony. Uh, forgive me if I got the number wrong. And they were going for it 
uh, the whole uh, first movement and I was sat there and I could hear every single instrument around me surround sound and I took the pictures and this was the picture that I took. Uh, and, uh, and these are some of the pictures that I've taken and if you see this picture, this is actually me uh, sitting down in front of the principal conductor whilst he is conducting uh, the Mahler Symphony. And it, to me, I would say I, this, this is probably the most unique experience I have ever uh, gotten in my life. And I will always remember this time. And it was amazing. Okay, so, so that's my uh, prof, uh, being a professional photographer. And then I started to become a trainer. And the way I started to become a trainer was very interesting. Uh, I had, uh, I was a bit dysfunctional early on in my career. I was very good at what I did, uh, very able, very capable, and uh, I delivered more than what was expected of me. But I did have some problems with my uh, emotional intelligence. I did have problems with my with my social intelligence. I couldn't get along with people and there was a lot of stuff there which I may uh, uh, do a different show on. Uh, but I, I was fortunate enough to have been sent to, some, uh, to a very powerful program called the Business School for Entrepreneurs. Uh, and that really changed my life and that happened in 2002. Uh, it was an eight-day program and it was... Um, it was something that, that really pushed me to the brink and allowed me to discover myself a lot about of why I behaved the way I did and a lot of the things that was holding me back and limiting my results. So I began to make some changes and people were noticing a lot about the changes that I was making. And, uh, you know, people would say, hey, Reza, what, what did you do? You know, oh, I noticed a lot of change in you. And, you know, I would sit down with them over a cup of coffee and I would share what I've gone through and what I've learned at the BSE. And then from one person became two person, two person became three. And then suddenly somebody had asked me, in fact, the first person to give me the opportunity to be a trainer is watching right now, and that is my very close friend Hamida, Hamida Abdul Ghani of Petronas. And she said to me, Reza, I think you can do a good job. I want to give you uh, a time to conduct training for my department. And she gave me one hour. And I tell you this, it was probably the worst training session I've ever conducted because everything that could go wrong did go wrong uh, but I was able to 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 hold it together and uh, and I still remember when we finished the session and I went out and I was talking to my team and I just broke down and said you know I I didn't know what I was doing just now but you know that was probably uh, one of the most uh, important moments of my life and it was thanks to you Hamida uh, and uh, so after that, people started to ask me to do more stuff. And I said, maybe there's something here that I can do. So I created a company called Right Eye. And for Right Eye, our motto is make everything a learning experience. This is my company's mission statement. Right, which is actually based on my personal uh, uh, mission statement. My company is all about the learning experience. This show, for that matter, is called The Learning Experience. My company's mission statement is make everything a learning experience. My personal motto is everything is a learning experience. And that has really been the focus of what I do and um, the company has been around since 2006, uh, 14 years now and still going strong. In fact, this year would have been our best year ever uh, and, uh, and I still think it could be our best year ever despite some of the challenges we have with the COVID-19 virus and social distancing and 
some companies deferring or even cancelling their physical workshops, which leads me to what I'm doing with you right now, because to explore the virtual world. So that is me. That is, in a nutshell, me. So I wanted to talk about what I wish I knew when I graduated, three things that you must know. So really, this, this would be, um, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily address this to only graduates or people who are about to graduate, because I think this also a lot of relevance to people who has been in the working force for a while, or even people who has left the working force, either retiring or uh, gone to do their own business. And I think this is extreme. This is something that that everybody should know. So, what are the three things that you must know? I would tell you right now, uh, three things that I wish I knew, and you should do. Number one, understand your value. Number two, add to your value. Number three, add value. So those are the three things. Shows over. Okay, so shows not over because obviously I have to go a little bit into what this actually means. Uh, what does understand your value mean? What does add to your value mean? What does add value mean? So uh, I'm going to. So we're going to focus a lot on value. But before I continue, let me just see who has left anything on the chat. Uh, Catherine, hello. Just thought I listen in as I'm cleaning my room. Haha. <laughs> I hope you're still watching now. Uh, Nur Fawaz Hanani, hello. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, Ali No Raza, hey Ali No here, watching your program closely. Thank you so much, Ali No, for being here and watching. Uh, I keep bumping into you near my house. Hope to bump into you more. Uh, and uh, okay, so we have uh, how many people are watching? We have six people watching now. Who is Sienna Moses? Hi, hi, Sienna. Okay. So three things that I wish I knew. Understand your value, add to your value, and add value. So let's go for understand your value. So when I graduated and I was trying to look for a job, one of the things that was most important to me was trying to show people and trying to demonstrate people how... Uh, knowledgeable I am because I, I went through my O-levels and I, and I had some knowledge there. I went through my A-levels and I have a law degree. And did, that would make me somebody who has knowledge. And what So what does knowledge actually mean? Facts, information, acquired through experience or education, the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject, right? So, so I have noticed, well, for me, when I graduated and about to join the workforce, and I noticed it, for a lot of people that I meet, graduates that I meet, or people who are about to graduate that I meet, and there is this very strong emphasis on the knowledge that they possess. Now, knowledge is important. How? Because they are the facts and information. So if you are... If you are a law graduate, you would have acquired knowledge about the law, the common law and the statutory law and the applications and principles of the law and any exceptions that can come from the principle uh, to the law. So, so, so that those are all information that I remember I had to remember in order to be able to pass the exams. If you are an accountant, then you would know all about the accounting principles and, wh and what you need to do and how you need to do things. If you are an engineer, you would learn about systems. You would know about uh, theories and all the formulas that's required in order to be able to do something. Uh, and, and that goes for everybody, right? That is important. But, if I put here, it is not the only thing. And this was the mistake that I made. And I was thinking I'm such a great 
prospect because I have a law degree, and that's not true. So, because if knowledge is one of the things that that defines your value, there are other things as well. And if you only rely on the piece of paper or the certificate that you have as a demonstration of your value, then you are going to find yourself to be not very valuable. Right? So there are other things. And there's, and there's specifically today, apart from knowledge, including knowledge, I want to talk about four things. There's more, but that's, those are the subject of other conversations. So the first thing that I want to talk about is experience. If you understand your experience, then you understand your value. If you don't understand, not understanding your value will put you in a very weak position when you want to uh, go for interviews or when you want to ask for a job. So what do I mean by experience? So I'm sure you've had uh, uh, opportunities or you've had the chance to go and apply for jobs, maybe. And one of the things that people ask is, what do you have working experience? And I've always, it's always puzzling to me when people ask a fresh graduate, do you have working experience? Because obviously not. Because I've been studying uh, for uh, for the last 10 years of my life to get to this stage, what do you mean by working experience? Uh, because I, I I'm a student and I and 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 I won't have the opportunity to work. So I think when they are asking what is your working experience, they are actually asking what is your experience, which means the process one of the definitions, the process of getting knowledge or skill from doing, seeing, or feeling things. And I would say that actually um, exp experience is applied knowledge. So you have knowledge that you've gained from school and from university, and your experience is how have you applied that knowledge successfully or unsuccessfully and i have a bunch of people who come who comes in and and does my uh who supports my workshop as crew members or logistics and some of them are watching now and i always tell them look you've got uh, all these things that i'm asking you to do is to add to your experience what you have been able to do if you remember i was talking about where is it my experience as a shoe store uh, help. And I, that was one of the most important experience of my life. And I was still at university, 23 years old, uh, wanting to find extra money and putting, uh, uh, you know, uh, going into a situation where I haven't got a clue and having to put myself um, to be in the charge of others and listen to others. And, and that, that to me was a very uh, worthwhile experience that shapes the way I work in the future. So I always tell people, look, if you have uh, holidays, go and work. Some people will say, oh, you know, I, I work at McDonald's or I work at Pizza Hut or, you know, uh, and that's the only thing I can do. And my response has always been, do you know how awesome it is for you to work at a restaurant uh, that is completely systematized like McDonald's? Because there is a way of doing everything. There, there is, uh, everything has been uh, thought out and there is a lot of opportunity for you to learn how things are done but a lot of times I see people they just go and work at McDonald's and just uh, clock in do their job and then clock out and they don't bother to observe and they don't bother to see how things are done when I was working at the shoe store I was watching everybody how things are done how are uh, 
um, what are some of the 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 difference in thinking that I can learn from? So not understanding your uh, your experience is really robs you of of increasing your value. Now I have a saying that experience is your best teacher. No matter how much you have learned, and I always tell this to my participants because they would tell me, "Oh, Reza, uh, I've learned so much, and I've I have." Uh, uh, I'm, I, uh, your session was useful. And I said, no, you haven't learned anything. You've just acquired knowledge. To, to learn means taking that knowledge and applying it. And the thing is, in applying the knowledge, we have to expect that there is going to be, there are going to be mistakes we're probably not going to be able to achieve what we want to achieve in the first time that we're doing it. Even right now, for me, I, when I wanted to do this live show, the first that, uh, that I've done, I haven't got a clue how to do it. And I, I always say to myself, when if I want to do something for the first time, I can't do it live. I have to do it first and experiment because definitely the mistakes are going to come up. I, uh, I would share with my participants what's the definition of practice and rehearsal. Why do we practice? Why do we rehearse? We practice and rehearse because we want our mistakes or potential mistakes to arise. And if the, the, the mistakes and potential mistakes can arise during practice and rehearsal, then we can correct it. If the practice and mistakes arise, if the if the mistakes arise during a live show, there's nothing much that you can do about it except to go for the next round. But it may cause you some embarrassment. So experience is uh, is is an important part. And I notice when I'm talking to fresh graduates, they, they don't really put much thought into the kind of experiences that you have. I don't have any experience. Of course you have. You just haven't thought about it. How do you get your experience? Let me ask you this. What has been your best, greatest, worst, disastrous success or failures, even at your age? What has been your best, biggest mistakes? What has been your biggest challenge and how did you do? When people come to me uh, for an interview uh, because they want to help out in my crew or they want, they want they want a job. One of the things that I would ask them is, uh, what has been the biggest mistakes you've made? And uh, what has been the biggest failure that you've experienced? And when I ask those questions, they get stumped because it is not something that they expected. So I would say, you know, you've, you've probably done a few great things and you've, you, you've, you have succeeded in many parts of your life, but success... But for me, uh, success does not reflect who you are or the character that you have. I want to know what mistakes that you've made. I want to know what failures you've gone through because I want to know how you have responded or reacted to those mistakes or to those failures. I want to know that you'll be able to get through it. I want to know what you've learned from it. It is unreasonable, it is unreasonable for me to expect or for anybody to expect that a person that you're talking to has never made a mistake, that the person that you're talking to has never failed. And even if they haven't failed or they haven't made a mistake, my counter to that has always been that you haven't aimed high enough. Then, then you're aiming to. So let me share with you. Uh, so that is my. Uh, uh, so that's why experience is important. Uh, you have to think about what experience have you gone through that makes you a person of character, because those are the things that future employers would look for. And those are the important things. All right, so let me just take a break and I want to see what people have written. Um, 
Uh, Fawaz Hanani, can this content be applied to a person who quit studying and continue with his passion? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Catherine, I'm still watching and I'm still cleaning and I'm still broadcasting. Uh, Sienna, can this content address one who wants to retire from a full office work and want to embark on a freelance career in tutoring, student and writing? Sienna, absolutely very, very relevant. Uh, it can. If the, 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 your knowledge and experience and the other two things that I'm going to share shortly is something that everybody should know, no matter what age. And I have just done this particular uh, la uh, show focusing on graduates as a way to pull people in, but it is absolutely applicable for anybody. Uh, I have been advised multiple times by my parents to not tunjuk pandai during work to avoid embarrassing my supervisor or boss in front of the high up. How true is this? Uh, Catherine, I will answer that shortly. Farah Shuhada, hey, Farah, Leng, I am late. Hi, Reza, hi, everyone. Okay. I'm going to have a sip of coffee because I need to chill out. I'm sweating at the moment. Whew, Reza, stay cool. All right. So experience is your best teacher. I want to share with you one of the most significant experience in my life that really shaped my career. And uh, it, this happened on November 29th, 1995. Uh, exactly uh, 10 months since I started working. Uh, and exactly uh, three months since I started as a legal counsel at Petronas Charigalis and Dirambahat. Uh, the upstream arm of Petronas, working in Wisma Pladang. Uh, and uh, I, it was about six o'clock uh, in the evening uh, and um, everybody had gone home. So, you know, I had some work that I needed to do and, and to get done. So I uh, usually would stay late. Now... Uh, the legal department of my, of my company is situated on the fourth floor. Next to the legal department is what's called the ECC, Emergency Control Center. And during my orientation, I was told that the Emergency Control Center will only be activated if there is an emergency. Uh, so on, the, on this day, 29th November 1995, at 6 o'clock in the evening, um, I noticed that there were a lot of activities in the ECC, which was puzzling to me because it's usually locked and deactivated and off. So if there is a lot of activity and the lights are on and people are going in and out, that means that there is an emergency. So I have been watching enough legal dramas to know, to see to, that, you know, maybe the lawyers should be involved. So here I am. 24 years old, a young punk legal officer, uh, barely out of university, going, knocking on the door of the ECC, opening the door and saying, and looking in, and the ECC at that time, it was, based, it was a lot, it, it was a big room with a lot of monitors, uh, you just have to imagine, um, it's like a mission control center. So there were people at the back near the door that was observing what's going on. And they, were, they had very stern looking faces. And I recognized some of them. Uh, they were senior management of the company. So when I knocked on the door and opened it, they immediately turned. I mean, it's, it's like something out of a movie. They turned, looked at me and said, Yes, what can I do for you? So I said, oh, hello, sir. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Reza. I'm with the legal department. Uh, I noticed that the ECC was on. I'm, I was just wondering, do you need uh, any legal assistance? So this guy, who shall remain nameless, just looked at me and said, no. We don't need lawyers at the moment. There's been 
uh, a crash, we are conducting a search and rescue operations. So I can share with you right now, when, when he said no, in that manner, my heart felt like it was going to jump out. Felt so embarrassed. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I went back to my, to my workstation and I said, this, tak puas hati lah, something, something not right here. So I said, okay, uh, I, I, I found out that there was something happening in Sabah. Uh, so I called uh, Sabah, the Sabah office, and I spoke to my procurement counterpart. I said, "Hey, what's going on here? So, uh, did something happen?" And he told me that actually there has been a helicopter crash, and they are looking. They are conducting a search and rescue operation. So this is basically a a. a a helicopter that was ferrying our staff um, to the offshore platform at Semarang. Sorry, I'm going to get emotional as I'm as I'm sharing this because it 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 was a very sad moment for me and for the whole company, for the entire organization. Uh, and uh, there were eight of our staff, and there were two crew members uh, of the helicopter. Uh, and the helicopter was a Bell 412, uh, registration 9 Michael Bravo Charlie Lima, 9 MBCL. Uh, and it had crashed. Uh, and if you look here, this is one of the things I found on the, on the internet. Crash at sea on the way, sending offshore crew to Samarang platforms. <coughs> So that happened. So when I knew that there was a helicopter crash, I said, okay, then there must be some legal and liability issues here. So you have to remember, I'm still very, very fresh from university, 24 years old. And I thought, I said to my Sabah uh, office uh, counterpart, uh, can you send me the contract? Fax to me the contract. So he did. And my God, the facts, the contract was this thick and it took ages to get facts over. There wasn't a lot of emails going on then. So by the time I got the, the, the facts of the contract, it was about nine o'clock. And so I just went through it. I went through the contract. I went through the liabilities and indemnities. I went through insurance. I went through all the things, did some notes. And then I went home. It was about 11 o'clock. The next day, uh, I was in the office early and uh, my boss came in and said, there is uh, something, there has been a helicopter crash. Um, he called in for an emergency meeting for all the lawyers. There were six or seven of us, big department. And he said, uh, there has been a helicopter crash and management wants an update on the legal issues. We, the lawyers were not informed. I wasn't informed and we are expecting a call from management right now. What are we going to do? So here's Reza sitting right at the end of the table and I said, hello, sir. Actually, I was here and uh, I had asked around uh, and I, uh, I managed to get a copy of the contract. So I handed him the copy of the contract. Um, and, you know, the contract was this thick. Uh, and he said, wow, okay, uh, we have to study this right now because we need to brief management. So I then gave my boss, oh, by the way, I did a little summary of the contract. So here it is. And as and soon as he took that piece of paper, the summary, uh, his phone rang and uh, he had to update our patronage management on what's going on as far as the contract is concerned and he used exactly the notes that i gave him it turned out my analysis was horribly wrong it was a complete disaster but it sounded good uh, and uh, and um, that really if there was one defining moment in my career that was one of it we didn't um, we didn't uh, manage to locate any survivors uh, 
Um, so, um, and and at being a, a young lawyer at that time, I was involved with uh, doing the whole management of the next of kin with human resource, and I did a lot of follow up sessions and all of that. Uh, and uh, I, I still remember eight of our staff and two of the crew member from the company that chart that we chartered the helicopter from. And you know there were uh, people, there were staff that was just married, and there were some whose wife or expecting a baby, and there's somebody who's <coughs> has a baby in arms. <coughs> So I, I tend to get extremely emotional when I hear, uh, even though I'm not in Petronas anymore, I tend to get extremely emotional when I hear about uh, accidents and mishaps happening in uh, Petronas operations because I, I take it ex exceptionally personal when things like that happen. Anyway, uh, so a few months later, I began to have uh, to be, I noticed that I began to get very strong, very, uh, I would say, uh, awesome opportunities for work and project work. And I was given assignments that normally were not given to a lawyer my age. And it wasn't until a long time later that my boss actually said to me, hey, you know, I want you to know something. Do you remember... Do you want to know why that you are given all these opportunities? And I said, no. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, why? And he said, uh, the reason why you were given this opportunity was because on that day when the helicopter crashed, without any instruction, without any, uh, any, uh, anybody telling you, you took the initiative to go into the ECC room to ask if there's anything that needed to be done by legal department, and if, if that wasn't enough, having been told no, uh, you didn't give up and you actually pursued and went to and did things that you knew was the right thing to do. And that showed your potential. And, and that was an extremely strong, had an extremely strong impact on me. Uh, and that was an experience I will never forget. Uh, and I will always say right now, for me, one of the things that I make sure I do is I would make sure that I do what I think is right. And I don't wait for people and I don't mind judgment from other people. So that's my experience. I'm sure you have your experience as well. No matter what age you are, and, and there, are, there has been comments from people who are asking me, does this apply for people who have quit their studies or had, does this apply for people who wants to leave work or has, does this apply for people who has retired? Of course it is. You are the sum of, part of you is the sum of the experience that you've gone through. There is value in that. When I go and uh, market my consulting service to companies and organizations, <laughs> excuse me, I don't go to them and say, hey, these are all the big projects that I've done and these are all the wonderful things that I've done. I don't do all that. I used to, but I don't anymore. What I do is, excuse me, is to say, look, these are all the projects that I've done and these are all the mistakes and mess-ups that I have been personally involved in. These are all the, the, the failed change management projects that I've been involved in. And I share that simply because my, my message to people is, if I have gone through these mistakes and failures, at the very least, I can prevent your project from going through the same mistakes and failures. And that's the important part. That's what makes you valuable. Understand what your mistakes are. Understand what you have failed. There must be somebody out there who wants to know what you know, who wants to, who wants to understand what you have gone through so that they don't have to go through it. If you are not able to articulate 
the worst moments of your life or the biggest mistakes of your life or the biggest failures of your life, then you haven't really, really understood your experience. And if that's the case, then you don't understand the value that you bring. Experience is your best teacher. But you have got to teach yourself about yourself. All right? So that's knowledge and that's experience. What is that? Oh, bonus time. Okay, we are about to have some fun. I have some stuff for you because I, I'm told in my research, I need... So I am going to ask a question, right? And I, I got, I, for prizes, I've got this. This is... A mug and make everything a learning experience. Uh, so this is a personalized mug for me and my company. And this mug will go to the person who is able to answer my next question. Okay, so let me let me just go there. All right. So the question, I'm just gonna type it in. All right. All right. So, a uh, few things. Uh, this is applicable to Malaysia only, um, because I need to find a way how to to send this overseas. Not that I have any overseas viewers anyway. Probably not. You're all Malaysians, I think. Uh, but uh, Malaysia and Malaysia includes Sabah, Sarawak. I will send this to you if you can answer this. The first person to put a comment in the comment section with the answer. And this is the question. What is Reza's personal motto? What is Reza's personal motto? And you have to be word perfect. What is Reza's personal motto? All right, what is Reza's personal motto? So the first person with the correct answer will win this mug and with that we will go for a three minute break see you in three minutes
Okay, welcome back. So I have some response here. Uh, Nor Fawaz Hanani, everything is a learning experience. Sienna Moses, everything is a learning experience. Muhammad Az Hanani, everything is a learning experience. And through some faith, uh, through some luck, your response came first. Uh, Sienna Moses, a little bit slow, but never mind. There's another bonus thing coming up, an even bigger thing. So please keep your eyes and ears open for the next bonus round. Uh, okay, so let's continue. So that is experience. So first, you have your knowledge, then you have your experience. Understanding your knowledge and your understanding your experience is part of understanding your value. Next, I want to talk about skills. What are your skills? Now, uh, what is skill? Skill is basically the ability to do something well or expertise. Now, when you uh, are asked to submit your CV or when you're asked to um, fill in uh, a job application form, one of, the, one of the components, one of the section is list out your skills and i and i look at when I, I remember the cvs that i would look at and the skills that they put in uh are quite depressing or quite distressing it's not that the what they they put something that's not correct but it was very obvious that it was something that was a cut and paste uh that they put in uh, so skills are very important because the skills demonstrates your ability to do something well. And if you can't do something well, then if you're not skillful, uh, then no matter what knowledge you have, no matter what experience you have, if you don't have the skills to come with it, it doesn't really make you valuable. So I wanted to share a video. Uh, this is uh, by Tim Ferriss. And Tim Ferriss, uh, is the author of the Four Hour Work Week, which was which is a great um, uh, a brilliant book uh, that teaches you about systems thinking and being an entrepreneur. So I wanted to play this for you. So I'd like to explore the question I get a lot, which is, should I specialize or should I be a generalist? And my answer, in short, would be you should be a specialized generalist. So let me explain what that means. When I interviewed Scott Adams not long ago, I suppose it was a few years ago, it doesn't feel like long ago, I, Scott, who is the creator of Dilbert, uh, I looked up some of his older writing related to career advice, and he had some really sage advice that I have applied in many, many, many ways. Uh, since uh, in concrete form. And his recommendation in brief, although I'm paraphrasing here, of course, is try to combine a handful of skills that are rarely combined. In other words, if you want to just specialize and become a basketball player, you really need to be in the top 0.001% to phenomenally well financially and otherwise. On the other hand, if, say, you combine two skills that are valuable, but even more rare and therefore more valuable together in many instances, like a computer science degree and a law degree, or extreme knowledge of finance and or mathematics plus public speaking, automatically you have a competitive advantage that allows you to more likely end up, say, in the top decile of earning power. All right, so you're not trying to master a thousand different skills. You're not dabbling as a dilettante in a million things and never going, say, a mile deep, but you are spreading yourself out across multiple skills that are rarely combined and can be very effectively combined. Warren Buffett. All right, so what Tim Ferriss is saying is this. it's not enough for you to rely on uh, the, your, the knowledge that you have without 
the necessary skills to be able to use that knowledge. So let, let, me, uh, let me just tell you what I mean by that. Okay. Um, you look at me, all right? What Tim Ferriss is saying is combine skills that are rarely combined. If you want, if you have a certain profession and you want to be very successful in that profession, there's going to be other people in the same profession that's competing with you. And really, you have to be in the top 0.01 percentile of that, of, of, of that profession to be very, very successful. So what Tim Ferriss is saying is that it is better for you to start looking at the skills that you have and combining these skills to form a unique package or combination that will make you more valuable. So let's look at my example, Reza. Uh, I would say one of the things that made me successful in my career at the beginning I mean, as a legal officer, you know, that there was somebody there, there's always, I recognize I'm not the best legal officer or lawyer there was, right? Uh, there are other people with better knowledge of the law than me. But there was one thing that I excelled in that not many people can match me, which was my communications skills. And communication skills is, 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 is more than what we think it is. Communication skills is the ability to the ability to um, the ability to transfer an idea from my mind and through words or uh, spoken or written be able to transmit that idea to another person that they will get the same idea that I have. That's what true communications is. It's not about being a good talker. It's about being able to simplify concepts for that people can understand. And I was extremely good at that. I was also a good problem solver. I love problems, you know, and, and I don't get distract i don't get distressed i don't get upset i don't get frustrated with problems i solve them what what is the cause of the problem how do we resolve it can we test this out what's the hypothesis here that's my train of thought i'm also good at negotiations uh, uh in patronus as a legal officer i was involved in many many large scale negotiations which taught me a lot of things and negotiation was one of the things that I did constantly. I have strong project management skills from my days in iPrintis and in commerce.com in uh, being able to understand the goal of the project, come up with milestones, come up with the tasks, come up with the resource requirements, and then managing the journey towards obtaining that goal, including the, the risks and challenges and issues that's inevitably going to come up. I have legal skills. You know, being able to identify the issue and state the law that applies to the issue, applying the issue, coming up with certain exceptions to the law, if applicable, coming up with a recommendation on how to get things done from a legal perspective. I have my consulting skills, uh, being able to go in uh, either from a change management perspective or a strategic uh, perspective, uh, articulating a vision and coming up with the with the roadmap towards achieving the vision, doing a, a, and and all the things that make all the things that's required to make a great consultant. And I also have photography and videography, uh, and those are the two things that I enjoy doing. And it's something that is, um, you know, looking at a scene and trying to understand a different perspective, like how should a scene be lit? Uh, what is the composition element that's going to come in? Can we capture moment? 
and looking at things from a different perspective, being creative. And I have an understanding of systems and how things should work and what it needs to create a system. So I'm able to take all of these hugely different skills and combine them into one unique package called Razor that is able to look at uh, things from a perspective that only I can look at with all these skills that I have. So you have got to be able to articulate and identify what your skills are. So let's continue with uh, Mr. Ferris and what as one example, the world's most, or certainly one of the world's most successful investors, although anybody who's interested should check out Renaissance Capital as, a, as another extreme example of investing success. But Warren Buffett has said that his best investment was in, I believe, a Dale Carnegie speaking course, because being a good speaker, having a command of communication in spoken form and in written form, Warren's a very good writer, really provides you with an Archimedes lever for whatever other skills you happen to have. Because there are many who are, say, technicians in a specific field, but are not able to communicate effectively to lay people without dumbing things down. Warren's very good at this. And uh, therefore, I would encourage you to consider public speaking, writing, and negotiating to be three very easy add-ons or multipliers for whatever your core skill or skills might be. Those will give you an immediate competitive advantage. And when I think about my own career choices, the best career choices, the best project choices that I have made, I also tend to think about winning even if I fail. And this is also borrowing very much All right, so what are the absolute basic skills you need according to Tim Ferriss? He, he says public speaking, writing, and negotiation. I will put it into two primary skills, communication, written and spoken, and negotiations. And I'll tell you why. I don't care what profession or what background or what how or even it's okay let me let me make sure i phrase this correctly no matter how smart or brilliant you are no matter how awesome your ideas are no matter how fantastic your solutions to the problems are it doesn't mean a thing if you cannot communicate it to another person Communications, good communications is a prerequisite for everybody. And it frustrates me no end when I meet people, graduates, fresh graduates, first year uh, or even uh, entry level executives, and heck, even uh, senior level people who, uh, who are in the technical line like engineering who thinks that it is not necessary for them to develop their communication skills or the soft skills that, that, that people call it. I don't like the term soft skills. I like the term, I prefer the term essential skills because they are absolutely essential. And it is very important that people, that you know this. And you have to develop your communication skills either written Sorry, you have to develop both your written and your spoken communication skills. There's no other way around it. I it, it frustrates me when 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 people when graduates can't articulate what's going on in their mind and they end up being very general and they end up uh, undermining what I know they can offer from their knowledge and their experience. Second, negotiation. Why negotiation? Negotiation is a lot about human contact. Hum uh, negotiation involves conflict resolution. Negotiation involves a meeting of minds to get agreement. 
And those are the things that you need in order to function with other people around you unless you want to function on your own on an island somewhere. So according to Tim Ferriss, and I agree, communication, written and spoken, as well as negotiations, are the prerequisite skills that you need to have. And I take this... Um, and I treat this as very important. Even now, I'm always refining my communication skills. I'm always finding ways to make kids better. Right? I would add that another thing for me would be problem solving. Right? Your ability to solve problems as opposed to your ability to moan about problems and complain about them. All right? Okay. So you have knowledge, uh, experience, and skills. The next thing that we want to talk about is your principles. Principles, what are principles? Your guiding sense of the requirements and obligations of right conduct. What your sense of right and wrong, good or bad. What you are prepared to do, what you are not prepared to do. What do you find acceptable? What do you find unacceptable? And, and these are the principles that governs how you behave in certain situations. I have a very clear, I, right now I have a very clear, strong set of principles that comes from my faith as a Muslim. And, this, and this, this guides me in how I do things. But I noticed that even at my, when I graduated, principles didn't really mean a thing. Whatever happens, whatever needs to get done, I'll do it. And yet, the principles that you have define who you are. And right now, people would tell me, I, my, my principles are so clear to me and clear to people around me that I become almost predictable in the way I respond or react to certain situations. They can tell how Reza is going to uh, read. It is important that I know very clearly where I see in terms of how I behave. So those are the four things, knowledge, experience, uh, and uh, skills and principles. If you do not understand where you stand in all of these four things, then you don't really understand your value. And if you don't understand your value, how are you going to position yourself into what you want to do? Um, so, th so that is the first thing, is the first thing that we have to understand right so three things i wish i knew and you should do number one understand your value number two add to your value very simply now that you know what you are doing sorry now that you know your value and where you stand you have to put in some effort to add to your value you add to your value by saying what other knowledge can you acquire what what experience can you get in applying the knowledge what skills do you have that you can either deepen or what skills do you have what's what skills that you don't have that you want to start adding to your repertoire of skills and uh understanding what your principles are uh, and writing them down in terms of maybe your core values. My principles, my core values are, uh, which is the same as my company, are uh, integrity, mastery, excellence, and the environment. And these are the four things that really govern a lot of how I do things, uh, both at my organization as well as my own personal behavior. All right. Both at my organization as well as my own personal behavior. All right. Okay. Uh, add to your value. Now we're coming to the end part, which is add value. Add value. Uh, hang on. So this is very important because adding value means asking yourselves, how does my presence make things better for others? Don't go. I remember when I was 
graduated and I was desperate to look for a job, it was only about uh, what can I do. And when I started working, uh, it was about getting my task done. And it was, and it was only when I started to move away from focusing on tasks and start focusing on adding value that my career really changed. If you remember the helicopter crash, me knocking on the door was not part of my task. Me taking the, uh, finding the contract and doing my analysis of the contract was not really my task, but it was my way of adding value. And I notice a lot of people right now, it's all about, you know, I, if, if, you, if you focus on completing a task, it really means that this task that you need to complete is something that somebody else can do as well and something somebody else can do as well. And actually, a hundred other people can do it as well. And if a hundred other people can do the same task as you and get it done, what makes you more valuable than them? Really? So I would argue that it's all about taking that task, getting it done, and asking yourself, how do I add value to this? How do I add value to this? How does this become better simply because it passed through my hands? Now, if you remember the things that I am here, all the things, all the skills that I combine, this is something I am able to add more value as a consultant, as a trainer, because of all the things that I have combined. And that makes me unique, and that makes me valuable, and that makes me somebody that companies wants to hire uh, for part of their project. You should find ways of how to add value. And, and if you're not adding value, then you've got to start thinking of ways to add value to the people around you, to the environment around you. And it's very easy to spot somebody who doesn't. It's very easy to spot somebody who just who is a very task-oriented person who just wants to get things done without a thought of the value that they attach to it. All right? Uh, so there is a principle that I learned called more with less. So for me, even uh, a few years after I started uh, my career, and especially right now, I can offer more than another person with... Uh, I can offer more with my combined skills than the normal average consultant. That's what I truly believe. It's very, you'll be very hard pressed to find uh, a person with a legal skills that is very proficient in. You'll be very hard pressed to find uh, a person with a legal skills that is very proficient in uh, the technical parts of photography, videography, as well as IT. All right. And, and I'm very, very uh, sure of that. And, and my ability to add value to others is what makes me valuable. Your ability to add value to others is what's going to make you valuable. And if you can't add value, then you don't have much value. And you, if you don't have much value, how much salary can you, do you think you can get as a self-employee? Sorry, as an employee or, or as a self-employed person or even as an entrepreneur. The basis of business entrepreneurism is your ability to add value to the, to, uh, the society and the community that you are doing business in. Okay? All right, bonus time. Before we go for a short break, uh, so I've got a question. I've got a real juicy question. I hope you've been paying attention. Okay. I've got an announcement to make. 
So just now we had uh, Fawaz who answered the first question, uh, and then Sienna who answered the first question correctly but was a bit late. So I've got to make a declaration that Fawaz is actually part of my crew. So she is absolutely critical that she knows this. So I'm not going to disqualify her. I'm still going to give her her mug. I'm also going to give Sienna her mug as well. Right? Because she answered everything is a learning experience. But before I announce the next bonus question, I'm going to say... If you have worked for me as a crew or in my company, then you are disqualified from answering. You can answer, but uh, your answer won't be counted. Okay? All right. So, the next question is, what are Reza's values or core, let's call it, or values. If you remember, please write them in the section box. Uh, and um, you have to get the number correct and you have to get the actual words correct. It doesn't matter what order it's in. And with that, we're going to take another three minute break. See you in three minutes before we finish off this show. Okay, what are Reza's core values? Uh, Sienna Moses, yay. I don't know you, but Hamida had asked me to read her a lot because I did. Uh, Catherine, a lot because I did. Uh, Catherine, integrity is definitely one of them. Yes, integrity is one of them, but there are actually more. Okay, there are four. 
uh, values. Uh, so if you can think of it, please write them down. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to share something else with you, uh, a little bit about my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so, okay, so why am I doing this? I intend to make this into a weekly show. Uh, I haven't decided on the channel. Uh, so, okay, so why am I doing this? I intend to make this into a weekly show. Uh, I haven't decided on the day and time yet. I did this on Sunday morning because I wanted... Uh, fresh. I wanted people who are in university to watch this. And I know at least some of the crew that I have at university, they are studying from Monday to Friday, even during the COVID-19. They're doing web conferences and online e-learning. Uh, so I'm doing this. Uh, so this one is on Sunday morning. I, I want to... There, there, are, there are a few things that I want to do. Number one, I want to turn this into a weekly event where I just share certain perspectives that I have in this situation. So that's one. Number two, I want to get into a, a talk show type, which means that I will be inviting guests to come in and, and ask them questions and, as part of my own learning experience. Uh, and um, so those are the two things that I intend to do. Uh, now, I have a channel. So I just wanted to share with you... Uh, what my channel is about and why it's taken quite a big chunk of my time and effort whilst you are still thinking about what Reza's core values are. So let's see, this is my channel trailer. It will be a, a record of what I do uh, and um, YouTube, for me, as I think for a lot of people, is becoming an important witness to my life. Uh, and that's amazing. And I hope somebody is going to look back at all these videos, say, hey, you know, that, that sounds, that looks uh, like an interesting person. I wish I knew him. Okay, so that's my channel. If you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe to my channel uh, and please share with other people as well. So what are the questions that we have? Uh, we don't have anybody at the moment. So the bonus question is still, uh, is still up for grabs. Let me tell you what you're going to win. You're going up for grabs. Let me tell you what 
you're going to win. You're going to win one of these um, collared shirt uh, that says, I don't know if you can see it, Learned R. So, learn, so this means uh, don't be a learned person, be a learner. Uh, so that's what uh, is uh, the prize for the person who can answer what are Reza's core values. All right. Okay. So we're coming to the end of our session. So understand your value, add to your value, add value. Uh, I think this is important for you to understand and really think about. Uh, understanding your value, your your knowledge, experience, skills, and principles is something that would define you. Uh, I would say that it's not that people, the fresh graduates that I met are not capable. It's just that they haven't been asked to think in a certain context. They haven't been asked to think in terms of these four things. But this also applies to you if you are... Um, if you have been employed in an, if you are, um, if you have been employed in an organization for a while, or even if you are seemingly at uh, going towards your retirement age, and I know some some of you are, uh, being able to understand the value that you bring makes you more valuable. Somebody was saying, asking a question just now about um, uh, Sienna. Okay. Uh, Sienna, uh, do share on the courage part to make the first move in starting a freelance career. I I'm going to make that next week's... Um, I think I'm going to make that one of the... Okay. I'm going to make it an actual show and share with you what the thinking that I had to go through in order to jump from being an employed person with uh, starting as a freelance consultant and eventually incorporating my own company and turning it into a business. So there's a, there's a, there's a big thinking before uh, 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 behind there. Uh, and there is a video... Uh, very important. Let me sh look at the video. Okay. So there is a, a series of videos that I did that would answer your question, which I'm putting into the chat session, is a playlist and there's a series of three videos that really takes you through it. But I will be doing this as a show um, uh, probably next week or the week after that. So I'm putting in the playlist right now. Um, and um, the other question that I have that I want to... Uh, from Catherine, I have been advised multiple times by my parents to not to enjoy pandai during work to avoid embarrassing my supervisor or boss in front of the higher ups. How true is this? Okay. I'm probably the wrong person to give you an answer to this because my answer is going to be very controversial. Uh, I believe in doing and saying what is right. And even at the beginning of my career, I ruffle a lot of people up simply because of my lack of filters. When I say filters is, I would just say whatever comes to my mind. Uh, and I don't really uh, pay much attention to the consequences of what I say. Uh, and sometimes it would, it would hamper my career and it, it has given me some grief. However, uh, there has been moments, there has been times when uh, people would tell me my ability and my in my lack of inhibition of telling people of telling people exactly what I think has been my strength. 
uh, that people will know that I mean what I say and I say what I mean. Uh, but I can understand why your parents would say this because at the end of the day, it is very lucky that you would have a boss that is so comfortable and so confident in his or her ability, so much so that they don't mind having other people working for them who knows more and who is smarter than them. See, for me, uh, one of the uh, one of the path to success, and I really believe this, surround yourself with smart people, hire smart people, and let them get the job done. And when I advise, uh, when I advise and when I coach uh, leaders in organizations, and I sometimes do that, I will always tell them that it it is unreasonable for you to consider yourself to have to be the smartest or the best or the most knowledgeable person of any team that you meet, because at some point you will find yourself in a situation where. There is somebody below you who's smarter than you. There's somebody below you who knows more than you. There's somebody below you who does things better than you. And that's a big shift. Now, having said that, you are going to find yourself working for people probably with some inhibitions of their own. And yes, sometimes your what your parents say is right. Maybe sometimes these people would react negatively when you tunjuk pandai. So I would say from my own experience, I, I've gone through the pains of being labeled tunjuk pandai. And looking back, I would say that if somebody were to ask me, would I change the way I did things? I would, I would not change the, my desire to be able to articulate what I think but I would learn to be more persuasive. I would learn, and this is where, is where communications and negotiation comes in. I would learn to position what I want to say in a softer way, instead of in the real aggressive, usual manner that Reza uh, does it. Okay, so that's my response to that. Uh, Nur Fawaz Hanani, Integrity, Responsibility, three and four. Uh, okay, integrity, yes. Responsibility, no. Three more. Okay. Uh, what can you do with all this wonderful knowledge that, that I have given you? Three things that you can do right now. Number one, list out your knowledge, skills, experience, and principles. Take a piece of paper and write them down. This is the knowledge that you have that you know something areas that you know more than what other people know. These are the list of skills that you have. Un understand, do you have solid communication skills? If we follow Tim Ferriss, written and spoken, can or do you have solid negotiation skills? Right? And for me, I would add, how are you at problem solving? If the answer is no, my skills in that is negligible, then number one, find other skills that you have. And when I say skills, I want you to be able to articulate what skills you have. What can you do that you are so confident in doing that you can walk into a room and know that you're going to be in the top 1% of people in those skills? All right. Number two, uh, okay, then uh, list out what are the experiences that you have what mistakes have you made? What are the failures that you've gone through? And really, really get to know yourself. As well as write down a list of the principles that you hold dear. Don't, uh, and maybe in a future session, I will do a, a session in identifying your, um, your values. Uh, mastery, not responsibility. Catherine Wingsett, integrity, mastery, environment, and excellence. You are right. Fawaz, how can you get that wrong? Really, seriously. All right. So, yes, Catherine Wingsett, you have just won yourself one of these T-shirts. I will get your, your size uh, and, and will pass it to you. All right. 
Okay. So, yes, integrity, mastery, environment, and excellence. So, back to what you can do. Number two, develop plans to either acquire or deepen. Add to your value. If you don't have... Com- seriously, seriously, come on. If your communications... If you don't have strong communication skills, you've got to develop it. You've got to, you know, in a future sessions, I'll probably do some things on communication. But you can go on YouTube. How Just type how to communicate better, how to articulate better, how to write, how to come up with a structure, how to present. These are all basic uh, skills that you, that I don't, I can't even begin to tell you how important they are, Right? And the things about skills is that it is something that can be acquired. If you, if somebody else has been able to get these skills and develop them, so can you. Right? But you have to want to do it. So it's either acquire new skills or deepen skills that you already have. And number three, list out how you add value to what you do. You have to be very clear. What is it when you walk into a team, when you join a team, how does your presence make that team better? And you've got to be able to answer that. Right? For me, sometimes, and this is what happens with people who work in organizations, the value that they add when they look through a Uh, report or when they look through a paper, the value that they add is correcting grammar and spelling. Those are important things. But there must be other things that you can add value to that paper or that report that you are reading that has been submitted to you. You have to be able to look at it strategically. You have to be able to look at it from different points of view. Otherwise, Uh, if the value that you are adding are the same value that a hundred other people will add to that particular task, then you you don't become much valuable. And I will always take my example, uh, myself as an example to be able to look at things from multiple points of view. That 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 this person that you see talking to you is a unique person because of the unique combination of skills that I have put together and my desire and ability to add value. All right. And that we come to the end of our session. So I, a few things that I need to do. Number one, uh, there's going to be a Zoom conference in a short while after this. Uh, And uh, I had limited, limited it to 10 people, but there's only six of you. Uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, we're going. To, it is now 11:44. We're going to start the Zoom session at 12:15. I'm going to put the. Where is the where, hang on. I'm going to put the link to the Zoom session in the chat right now. Is it there? No, it's not. Okay, so can't do that. All right, I'm going to put it in the chat right now and I'm going to open it up. If you are to open it up if you are hang on hang on
I'm just copying and pasting the Zoom invite into the live chat if any of you want to come. So I'll be there at 1215. If there's nobody there, then that's fine. But if one of you is there, you want to ask more questions, then by all means do so. Okay, I can't do that. All right, so that's the Zoom session, and there's a password in here for some reason. Password is 771978. Password is... seven seven one nine seven eight. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions and you know, we, we can actually, it's a better interaction there. Okay, so uh, just before we end, there are a few things that you can do for me. Number one, uh, please like this video, click on that button right now. Uh, leave a comment if you have any questions uh, and you can re-watch this if you want. Uh, and uh, and um, but, you know, questions can come up in our Zoom conference. Uh, leave a comment if you have any other topics you think I can help you with. So some of you have been putting in other questions and all that, which is useful, uh, because I will look at those questions and, and see if I can respond immediately or that there is some value towards developing a whole show. Uh, share this video with others. So take this video and share it with other people uh, and uh, for them to consider. And lastly, subscribe to my channel. Click on the subscribe button. I think most of you have subscribed. My subscription has increased from uh, 87 to 90. So there's more of you right now. But I want to get up to 100. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much for your patience and coming in. For those of you who know me and I know you, thank you so much for supporting me. Excuse me. And for new people, uh, thank you so much for, for watching. Uh, and uh, for the prize winners, Fawaz, Sienna, and Catherine, I will get in touch with you to get information on how to get the stuff from you. Uh, Mark is on the way for uh, Fawaz and... Uh, Mug is also on the way for, let's see, uh, for Sienna and a t-shirt for Catherine. And with that, it's 11.49. Uh, I am going to end this video. And thank you so much for watching. And um, the next week's video, next week's show is going to focus on, I'm going to tackle... I think it was Catherine's, was it Catherine's question? Um... Oh no, Sienna, Sienna Moses' question about, um, she asked, do share on the courage part to make the first move in starting a freelance career. That is going to be the topic of next show there's a lot of things that i want to share in terms of my thinking and uh, hope to see you there and with that thank you so much assalamualaikum please have a good day stay safe remember social distancing is 1.5 meters not 1.5 feet uh, and uh, stay safe and i'll see you in the next video